Okay, guys, this is chapter 37, Transport Operations. Going to bring you up over here. You should be used to this by now. There we go. You are now sharing your screen. And a lot of this is honestly a review. Because when we look at the ambulance operations and understanding that these things are stocked with certain equipment that you're allowed to carry. Let's let this just fill in. Again, we have to stress if there's questions on 37, 38, right? Whenever you come in for that first little brief period of time, make sure you're asking those questions so we can make sure we clarify anything that you may need. So ambulances, right, they're stocked. Ours might not be stocked out here, but they're pretty much that same type of ambulance that you find out on the road today. But when we look down at this first part here, emphasis on rapid response, it does place you in danger, you know, intersections and every time you turn on those lights and sirens, that's really something that you become responsible for. But what's most important is that the ambulance is awesome. We're asking people for the right of way when we do turn those lights and sirens on, but good patient care saves lives, not necessarily always the speed. So what is an ambulance? Well, I think we know that. That's where you can actually provide the care in the back of the rig while you're en route to the hospital. There are standards that these things are all designated from or designed from. That's the NFPA 1917. There are standards for automotive ambulances. We just ordered a new one and hopefully, you know, June 30th that should be delivered. But you have to make sure it has certain body structures and types and compartments and everything that you would expect to be able to safely carry the supplies that you are designated. The first responder vehicles, and again, this might be a police officer, or again, we've done this class at the mines, where they have a certain amount of gear in there that they can provide that basic care until an ambulance arrives, right? It's just being able to provide a certain level of care until someone else is there, because they are not going to be the transporting unit. They're just gonna be able to provide that care. So what's typically found within the ambulance, the driver's compartment, awesome. You gotta have two EMTs in there and also the ability to carry two patients in the supine position. So if they were on the spine board, right? There's the two-way radios and the communications you have, but these things should be comfortable and most importantly, safe, right? It's all about safety, 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 safety. So when we look at the star of life and there is a Another slide which actually explains what each of these sections means, but if you are an ambulance, it does have to be designated with that star of life on it. Here it is. And when we look at the early detection, early responding, the, again, on-scene care, that's where that star of life came from. I don't anticipate a lot of questions on the star of life, but certainly no where that comes from and you know just having an awareness of it because you see that on all the EMS equipment, right? That's the star of life. The phases of an ambulance call, and we'll go through, through these each as well, but from the preparation down to the post run and just some of the considerations of what will happen within each of those specific phases. So the preparation phase, right? That's the first one. One of the examples we utilize for that is making sure that your equipment is handy, right? Some of the more common things, you wanna place those in positions where it's easy to access. The, making our way through here, just examples of that, right? How urgency, how urgently and often these things are actually utilized. If, you know, I have an ashram and chest seal, yeah, I wanna make sure I know where that is, but that's not a, a common tool that you're going to be utilizing. So up at the top, you notice you might have some saline or some bandages up there, some pretty common things for trauma, but you always want those things transparent so you can see through and easily be able to know where it's at. But that's kind of up to you to know where your equipment is. All ambulances are gonna be stocked in that similar fashion per their department policy. But anytime you get into the back of a new ambulance, you have to make sure you know where all of your equipment is. 
And that just goes with the jump bag as well, right? We've worked with some of the jump bags and classes and you're like, oh, this is my airway side, this is trauma side. Just knowing where those things are. The gurney is gonna be in the ambulance as well. And of course, having a famili familiarity with that, knowing how it goes up and down. And that, if you remember back early on, we talked about how those red handles will be responsible for moving things. That's just common practice and knowledge you need to have. The one EMT must be with the patient at all times, right? They're in that compartment. So during transport, one drives and what's sitting in the back. That's again, just a, a common thing that you have to do. As far as your inspections in the preparation phase, and you don't have to be able to tear an engine apart, but you should be able to check the oil and the appropriate fluids, making sure the lights and the sirens are all operational. And you don't need to leave the siren on for 10 minutes. You just click it through each of their different, it could be a, you know, there's, the siren could be a whale, could be phaser. Again, those are all specific things we use in code three driving. But again, this is not certifying you for that code three driving. It's just letting you know how to do a basic truck check. But there are some safety issues we'll run through with the uh, actually driving to the call. Make sure you understand ambulances drive differently than a typical POV or maybe your small passenger vehicle. So dispatch obviously has to be able to reach you anytime you're out on shift. That when we start getting into the dispatch information, there's certain things they're going to, and I will say try and provide you with. Right, the nature of the call it could just be an unknown person down. That's a real common occurrence because someone's driving by, they see something they're unsure of, and then they let someone know. But obviously the location, how many patients you have would be awesome information, but we can't always guarantee that that's going to be available. En route to the scene, this is the most dangerous time for the EMTs or the paramedics as they're uh, driving to it. Crashes are obviously bad because that potentially slows you down and then it also slows down the person who you are trying to help Boom. arrival at the scene you know there's that initial scene size up as you come into that operation you know being aware that you're looking for any hazards that are there do you need additional units this really coincides right with the medical or the trauma assessment Oh, okay, I have my MOI versus NOI. How many patients do I have additional resources? And that's why capturing and being comfortable with the skill sheets are so important, right? Because a lot of this is simply a reiteration of what you're doing on that scene. Right now, I was setting something else up. So we're doing multiple things right now. So just bear with us, so thank you. Uh, mechanism of injury, again, you see the similarities to that trauma sheet. If it is a mass casualty, we're obviously going to want to start those additional resources, but let, and again, you may be that first one that assumes command. If you're the first unit on scene, that's fine. You'll relinquish that command once something, someone of a higher level shows up. But right now, we just have to identify, hey, I've got six patients that rolled out of the back of that van. That can certainly qualify as a mass casualty incident. In addition to that, the parking and making sure that you park, again, before or past that crash scene, you want at least 100 feet in there. We really want that buffer for you. But don't do it alongside the crash scene. Later on, there's an illustration of the safest place to park. And right now, Yes, we're concerned with traffic flow and keeping that moving, but you have to keep yourself, your partner, as well as those patients in that vehicle safe. So again, this is why you have that little 100 foot span in between the vehicle that has been in the accident, your own rig. But as you get out on scene, you have to make sure you're also cognizant that there could be vehicles that are trying to potentially veer around this area and we don't wanna put you in a dangerous situation. I didn't see it on here as well, but always make sure you have your safety vest on and that you're clearly visible. The uh, uphill and upwind from smoke or some type of hazardous gas, that always comes up. So there's a little hint for you. Not leaving your entire lights on, but at least those warning lights or flashers while you're at the scene. And 
the best way you're going to help this patient, honestly, is that emergency medical care and rapid transport from the scene. Remember when we're doing that trauma assessment, the goal is that you're spending no more than 10 minutes. That just relates back to the golden hour and how critical it is that patients do get to definitive care or surgery within that amount of time. That actually starts from the incident, not when you've actually shown up on scene. So here they will tell you if it's necessary to block traffic, work quickly and safely. I'm a big fan of blocking traffic because mom going home, my crew's going home, so we're just gonna keep everyone safe. In the transfer phase, again, as you're getting the patient onto the backboard or extricated potentially from that uh, vehicle, again, you may or may not be doing the extrication itself. It depends on a simple or complex extrication. There's just something that's coming from chapter 38, but simple just means you can open up the door and you can access your patient. If it's a complex, complex extrication, it means you actually have to use tools for that. So again, just kind of depends on what you're permitted to do, whether the firefighter EMT or my the EMT and I need someone to actually just extricate the patient. That's also why you're thinking about that call for additional resources. Making sure that the patient is certainly strapped down. We use that just to make sure we're not gonna accidentally tip them over or let them fall, but always make sure that the seat belts are on. When you do get ready to leave from the scene, you wanna make sure you contact the hospital. Let them know, hey, this is paramedic 6-5. We're going ahead with two patients being transported to your facility. My beginning mileage is 17.45. Great. So we just let them know. Now, you will see more on the arrival about, again, letting people know we're back on scene. But during that transport, medical and trauma assessment sheets as well, recheck that stable patient's vitals every 15. Again, if it's a critical patient or unstable, that's where we're reassessing every five. Contact the receiving hospital. You may have different orders that they want you to perform or you wanna confirm the treatment that you're currently providing. And always be aware that during that transport time with the patient, there's that, that conversation that needs to go on, right? What is it they need versus what is it they want? I'm gonna address your needs obviously first, but we're also caring and compassionate as we complete this transport. The delivery phase, so this means we've shown up at the hospital, right? Your dispatch needs to be informed, hey, that you're arriving. When you first go into the hospital, and it may be at the uh, triage desk or different hospitals are set up in different fashions. Some have the number of the ambulance that's arriving and where they're actually gonna take that patient. But we're going to transfer that patient, whether on a spine board or a draw sheet, onto the gurney for the hospital. The verbal report does have to take place, and this is very similar to what's on the uh, end of your medical sheet. How would you transfer care of that patient? So this is, uh, Mary marries a 68-year-old female who was complaining of chest pain. We went ahead and gave her the nitro and the aspirin. We kept her on oxygen. Initially, her complaints was the pain was an eight on a one to 10 scale, one being nothing, 10 being the worst pain she's ever had. And now she's down to a four. She's currently on 15 liters a minute high flow, high concentration oxygen. She states that the patient felt better when that was on. So again, that's just the, a brief synopsis of that, but we wanna make sure we not only complete a verbal, but a written report as well, right? That verbal is just, hey, this is what I'm telling you, and I'm gonna write that in detail so they also have a record of that. Again, depending on where you restock your items, some may restock at the hospital, others are gonna to have to do that back at the, uh, the station or the duty office, wherever it's appropriate, we wanna make sure we restock the ambulance so it's got exactly everything we started with when we, we initially went out on that call. En route to the station or your quarters, wherever it is you're going, this could be a place where you're restocking. Clean and disinfecting the ambulance and equipment, Again, it's been my experience that a lot of that is done in the hospital uh, ambulance parking area. Again, whether you're getting rid of sheets or using what's referred to as a stat pack. So again, this may or may not coincide exactly with how it's done here, but just know we wanna make sure that ambulance is clean and ready to go 
so you can put yourself, quote, back in service. Uh, differences between cleaning, disinfecting, high level disinfection, and then the, the uh, sterilization are listed as we go down. Again, you have to make sure you're in compliance with your agency's protocols, and of course that with the, uh, the state DHS that actually governs the ambulances, but there's written policies on what you're gonna throw away, what you're gonna keep, what you're gonna wipe down. The defensive driving techniques for the ambulance, and this is just a very brief overview of some of the things that we do in the actual driving course, or when you get hired someplace, they would actually take you through evade or evoc, emergency vehicle operators course, because it's really up to the agency to decide, yes, you've gone through my course and now we feel safe to put you on our insurance and subsequently drive the ambulance. But uh, anytime an ambulance is involved in the crash, it's just horrible publicity for you, for the agency. It doesn't look right, right? The ambulances are the ones that are supposed to be responding to those calls, not creating those calls. And sometimes, obviously, there's other drivers play a big part in that. But we have to be so cognizant that our responsibility is to drive with due regard, safety for others, not exceed our you know, appropriate speed limits. And you know, again, and those are all the agency's regulations and guidelines that they have in place for you. The requirements, again, occasionally there's ages that are required to drive the ambulance. Again, that can be up to the agency itself, but everyone should go through some type of emergency vehicle operators course. Physical fitness and alertness, and later on we look at how, if you've been on shift for that 23rd hour, right, are you fatigued? Do you need to stop? Do you need someone else to come and, and you know, take over for you? Those are things that you have to realize of yourself. It's similar to what's going on now with our masks and even being in here, that personal accountability, that is ultimately up to you. But due regard, and just a brief piece on due regard, is that is the recognition for the safety of others and the preservation of property, right? That is something you will always be, you know, they will look upon you and say, hey, was this person driving with due regard? Or were you just turning your lights and sirens on and blindly blowing through every intersection? That is certainly not driving with due regard. Uh, more of the, this is great, safe driving practices, right? Speed doesn't save lives, but good patient care does. Always have your seatbelts on, right? There's laws for this, but we too have to follow those. You always want your seatbelts on when you are driving that vehicle or if you're the passenger in the vehicle. So you also have to learn, and this is just a familiarity that comes with driving a, uh, an ambulance, right? Typically they're a lot longer from the front. You've got all of this extra width. So again, it's just something that takes practice, which is why you're uh, always going to go through the evoc, the evoc or the evade course. Just want to get you some familiarity. As far as staying in the extreme left-hand lane on multiple lane highways, that again, that's just where you're expected to be in the ambulance. As far as anticipating what other drivers are doing, right, you just always have to drive defensively, right? You can see as, as I drove in today, I saw some lady doing her makeup as she's, you know, driving and doing this. And I'm like, what? So I don't know what's going to happen. Is she going to drop that? Is she going to take the mascara and then poke her eye and she can't see? And there's going to be those changes. So again, that's what I mean by driving defensively and just being aware of what others are actually doing. Cushion of safety, again, one, one thousand, two, one thousand. Three, right? There's so much space you want between yourself and another vehicle. A vehicle such as an ambulance typically will have a you know longer braking distance. The being tailgated from behind, right? Let the person pass you. It's just not worth it. The blind spots and scanning that, it will take a while to get comfortable with that, but you really have to use your mirrors when you're driving an ambulance or anything larger than that. We should all drive with mirrors. You just have to get familiar with how they are in the ambulance. Siren syndrome, sometimes people hear that and then anxiety happens and they'll just drive even faster. So again, this is why in the previous uh, slide, it did say it takes this you know, emotional maturity. If you're gonna drive that, 
It's not just, whoo, I'll turn my lights on, or I can go as fast as I can. That's not going to get you very far. So when you look at the vehicle size and distance judgment, crashes occur when the vehicle is backing up. So always use a backer. It's called a spotter here, but always use a backer. You want someone to help you. And again, if you've been in one of our ambulance courses, you know that's one of the first things we do. We set up this safe area where you're just backing up into a cone. And this is great because we'll say, well, how far away do you think you are now? And oh yeah, I, I gotta be this close. I gotta be this close. And they've either gone two feet past it or they're even that far away. So again, it's such a hard thing to judge. Use a backer, right? Backers are required in all departments I've ever been on, and it's just common sense, right? It's, gonna, it's going to be preventative versus reactive. Always use a backer. Being aware of how that vehicle will actually curve or maneuver through something like these hairpin turns, we want to slow down with that again and just be aware that it can actually pull you into that other lane of traffic. That's what we're actually looking at here. So again, when you think about positioning that, you have to make sure you stay in the lane. Okay, you enter high in the lane and then you can exit low. It's just the only way you can drive those things. The weather and road conditions always play a factor, right? We have to think about rain here in the monsoon season that you get that oil that first comes up as it starts to rain and that can make that slick as well. So obviously we wanna avoid the hydroplaning. And again, when you can't see, sometimes we just have to slow down, right? So slow down, adjust to the weather and the road conditions because the roads aren't always the best either. And we certainly don't want anybody forced off of the road at any time. So laws and regulations with, you know, in regards to the ambulance, Okay, you may be allowed at some time to park or stand in an illegal location, right? If you work in an emergency medical call, that comes up. Proceeding through a red light, well, you can do that. I'm, I'm gonna tell you, even at a red light, it's still expected that you stop, look, and, and ultimately you're really asking those other drivers for permission to go through. Are they going to yield to you? Doesn't really matter if they don't and you, proceed through and you crash into them, that's going to look bad on you and your agency as well. So we look, we clear the lanes, we go through these things slowly and safely, and then maybe you saved uh, you know, 30, 40 seconds of time. But saving that time just by going through slower, and yeah, it'll take you, you know, a little bit more than just barreling through that intersection, but that's an example of due regard. Driving against the flow of traffic or something that's called going opposing, Again, it's something that should be minimized, but there are times when you may actually find that beneficial. You've got the patient in the back and you're so close to the hospital and all the traffic on your side is backed up, but this is planning ahead. It's looking before you get there and not just expecting that everyone's going to be paying the, the perfect amount of attention to you as we would like them to. As far as school zones go, okay, can't pass the school bus, Okay, can't do that. The bus has stopped to unload its children, right? You got to shut down at that point. So when we look at code three, and that's actually the second highlighted point here, that's a true emergency call. That's lights and sirens. That's how you would dispatch through something called a tiered response system. And if that you are dispatched code three to this location, great. But there's always that reminder of safety. Okay, I can't just blow through everything because my lights and sirens on. As far as escorts are concerned, you know, typically we only expect one emergency vehicle to be going through at a time. Escorts are great. If I'll give you an example of where I would use an escort. Going into the mobile home park in between Pantano, uh, on Pantano, between 22nd and Golf Links. That thing is a maze but it also doesn't have a, a ton of traffic in there. And so you pull off into this area, you're unfamiliar with your going, maybe that security guard is gonna lead you to that patient's house, right? That's really where we use escorts, not necessarily on the freeway and going through the middle of town. Intersections, obviously the most common area and the most serious area for these crashes. So again, 
you have to make that stop, look for pedestrians and other hazards. Again, that's always gonna be an expectation when you're driving an ambulance. Highways, so as you merge on to the highway, you actually want your lights and sirens off. It's not until you get into that far left lane or the one lane before you would turn those lights and sirens back on. It just, what are people supposed to do when you have your lights and sirens on? They're supposed to pull to the right. And if you're in the middle of the freeway and you're doing that, and then those people are actually coming in towards yourself, it just makes it much more difficult. So remember to not turn the lights and sirens on until you're in that left-hand lane, if your policy says that's what you're supposed to do as far as driving on the freeway in the code three. Unpaved roads, again, driving on dirt. Anybody that's had a vehicle or driven for a while knows that once you get on this silky dirt, you have a tendency to move that uh, back of that vehicle around. So again, that's why you have to be mindful of the speed and the, of course the conditions that you're on. School zones, unlawful to exceed the speed limit, right? You're given some compensations throughout this, but a school zone is one that you need to make sure you're following the posted speed limit signs. Now, distracted driving, again, there's very Little on this, there's actually cognitive distractions and physical distractions. You can be thinking about something and next thing you know, you just passed your exit. So that's more of a cognitive distractions as you're thinking about it. There's also a lot of physical distractions on here. That's trying to work the radio or grab this, I'm eating, I'm drinking, that's a physical distraction. So again, those things need to be minimized as you're driving the ambulance. Let your partner do that right? Typically goes where one is driving, the other is going to navigate them. And fortunately, a lot of the areas that you work may be the same. So with that, it's great. You kind of just drive around on your day off. You know where this place is or that place is. It just helps you when you're making those emergency uh, transports. Driving alone. Okay, your responsibility at this point. You're driving alone, and I can't think of, well, I can. It's called code 10, but that's typically someone who's on a tender or, you know, manning a station by themselves because the other units are actually out. So, again, you have to be mentally ready for that. You have to know how your vehicle works and how it's going to operate as you navigate through whatever area you're going. But always make sure you're, you're, you're fresh and you're ready to drive when you do that. There are different types of fixed wings or aerial airplanes that someone could be on. There's the fixed wing versus the helicopter. And these are also used for medical and trauma patients. The difference is, is that they're specialty crews, right? When we look at what's typically in a ground unit, could be two EMTs or it could be an EMT and a paramedic, okay? But you've got two people in there. As far as the medevac goes, you tend to have different levels of providers, right? They may be flying with a nurse or a critical care paramedic. So again, it might behoove that patient, if you will, to be transported via helicopter in some instances because transport's gonna take you 45 minutes to get there if you're driving or the conditions are horrible. Now, when conditions are horrible, we have to consider if the uh, helicopter is actually gonna be able to come in and land at your location. But normal, normal day, good weather, and the patient requires that advanced care, then that would certainly be appropriate. Multiple patients were overwhelmed resources at the hospital. Hmm, so multiple patients were ov will overwhelm resources at the hospital reachable by ground transport. So, you know, again, I even had to do it here. When you think about that, if there's this closer hospital that they could go to, but putting them all into that one hospital may be too taxing on, on that one facility. So is it better to fly them out someplace else where they can get more appropriate, not necessarily more appropriate care, but it's not going to put them into a situation where they're overloaded at that time. Who receives a medevac? So again, when we talk about time-dependent injuries, and these are some great ones, a stroke. Oh, time is tissue when it comes to the brain. Same thing goes with a heart attack, where time is tissue with that heart muscle 
or if there's some spinal cord injury and they obviously need to get to uh, you know the neurologist or that neuro neurosurgeon, that's something that you would certainly consider flying out. Same thing goes with trauma. Again, got an amputation or burns over you know 50% of someone's body, then that's going to be so much faster, and that's what would be appropriate to fly that person out. When we look at the helicopters and the LZs or the landing zones, it would be ideal to have at least that 100 by 100 foot for the landing. Making sure there's no loose debris. If you've ever seen a helicopter come and if it's a landing in some area that's got a lot of dust and loose rocks, so things will kick up, has the potential to hurt you, the helicopter, and then the patient. So you wanna make sure there's no hazards or power lines in the area when you do that. As far as marking the landing site with cones or vehicles, again, try and do that, but make sure that the lights or shining up are never aimed towards that pilot. You don't wanna use the flares either. Why don't you wanna use a flare? Well, when that flare is burning and we're adding all of that oxygen that's coming down, and then it could send the sparks, those things are gonna fly, just like any other loose piece of debris that you may have. So as far as the hot, goes that means those rotors are still turning so again that's why you want to wait till that shuts down and then you would approach but you always approach a helicopter from the front and you wait for someone to actually signal you and don't just blindly run up to that thing because they're going to frown upon that here's the danger of the tail rotors a lot of times these things run so fast you might not even see it so notice how that approach is set up from the front, the pilot, again, anytime I'm working with a helicopter, I wanna make sure the pilot has cleared me to enter. If you have the same radio frequencies and you can communicate them with them, that's even better. But again, we do have to be familiar with some hand signals and just knowing what these things mean. So again, just a brief familiarity with these, obviously left versus right and you know down, move this way. So they're pretty common. It's a common sense approach to these hand signals. You use the same thing when you're using a backer or a spotter for parking the ambulance. And that's why we want to have that, make sure everyone's using a consistent, you know, stop, this come forward, left versus right. On the night landings, please, please, please do not shine spotlights, flashlights in the air to help the pilot. Hey, you're going to blind him again that has that comes in. We want to make sure that area is focused towards the ground so then he can have a clear view of where he's actually landing. Again, communicating with the pilot would be awesome to let him know any of those overhead hazards or obstructions that they are dealing with. So it's just an extra mindfulness that goes on because you are going to help lead that pilot in if they're not able to see that. Stay away from the uneven terrain. Right, we can think about how the rotor would actually shift down if they are put on their side, even just a little bit. But we want to make sure if we do approach from the downhill side only, and again, and that's after everything is stopped and it's still from forward or the front of the helicopter. If you are dealing with hazardous materials, you know, you know, recommend we decon those patients before we put them in is what is that going to do to that arriving crew? So again, their landing zone, uphill and upwind, but if we do have a patient that's a decon or that is contaminated, you have to make sure that they are decontaminated before loading them onto the helicopter. Same thing goes before we bring someone into an emergency room, right? I don't want to infect that entire area. Maybe they're off-gassing some chlorine, whatever it is, so the patient's stripped down. And I know we're probably getting into decon chapter and things that come a little bit later, but it's all in the same module. So again, that's why we'll have that familiarity with decontamination processes on your patient, but they always have to be decontaminated before we actually put them into the uh, helicopter. So assess the severity of the weather, environmental, or I'm sorry, the environment or terrain. And there are some times that helicopters are gonna be unable to fly right? They can't do it if it's too hot, or again, maybe that's going to adjust their, their fuel, you know, how high they're able to go. So again, as you call in and maybe you're requesting a helicopter, they may tell you that they're grounded. Okay, they're grounded means they're not going to fly because their safety is important as well. So we have to be aware that if you've ever seen the inside of some of these medevacs, 
again, it's a relatively small area that they have to work with. They also have to be aware of the patient's size. I mean, how much do they weigh? And is this something that's going to be, you know, feasible for them to safely do? So again, in temperature conditions and all of that will, have, will be a factor when it comes to making those determinations. So here's just one of the review questions because I think it's great to cover one of these and then let you know the rest of them are certainly available on the slides. But all the following are examples of standard patient transfer equipment except, hmm, well, we have Stokes baskets, something that just goes around and can help extricate and move the patient, the long backboard, the wheeled stair chair, and wheeled ambulance stretchers. So as far as we look at transfer equipment, then bing, 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 each ambulance should carry a primary wheeled ambulance stretcher. And again, know that these review questions are on there. We always encourage you to make sure you're reviewing just from the lecture that we had just so we can address any questions that do come up as we get to the, uh, especially the end of this. I know you guys have probably two, maybe three weeks left before you're all done and that's just very exciting. So as far as the transport emergency goes, let's run over any questions you guys have with that once we see you, I believe it's on Wednesday or it could be Thursday, but that's 37 and we will see you in class on the next day you're there.